I'm here out in front of school to discuss uh, chapter one on this lovely August day here. And uh, oh, you can even see a jet going by in the sky up there. But we're gonna kind of talk about chapter one um, out front of the school here today. So if you wanna follow along, these, I will put this online. You will have access to this, what I have printed off here um, online. So you can take notes if you want, cause I'll add more detail in. Um, but you can print off this at home if you wanted to uh, with a link that I can give you and you can find on the classroom website. So um, guys, first of all, so chapter one, Columbia. And uh, especially in the 1800s, we're, we're going back farther back than that today, but especially in the 1800s, it's kind of born back then. But this notion that America is Columbia, it's this female embodiment of America. Uh, today we might call her less Columbia and more Lady Liberty, but she's she's really uh, used a lot in the 1800s. One example of Columbia might be the Statue of Liberty. If you ever look at the Columbia Motion Pictures, the movie company, there's this lady who looks like the Statue of Liberty. And she's ho often holding a torch because she's spreading light. And by light we mean, uh, or the Europeans back then meant like civilization, laws, order, education, society, technology. And so there's this idea that the Europeans claim that you know they're, they're spreading light, society, education, technology, rule of law, government, and democracy, and stuff like that to the New World, the America. And so Lady Liberty, or Columbia, is the embodiment, the female embodiment of America, or at least the European version of America. What's interesting is, especially in the 1800s, uh, particularly like let's say uh, you know late 1800s with the um, for example Spanish American War or the Philippine American War Colombia is used as an example by a lot of people to um, push the America aggressively into new areas militarily but just kind of put that on hold for now well humans are not indigenous to the Americas so how did the first humans get here um, so there's different theories for the longest time, a lot of people thought that, you know, 10,000 BCE, which would be about 12,000 years ago, so about 12,000 years ago that there's a land bridge. I mean, think about this. We're in this ice age, so you have all, you guys know this, the Great Lakes. You look out Holland and you see Lake Michigan. And at this time, Lake Michigan is a massive glace, glacier and Michigan's covered in ice. And, and some people say that the, the, the glacier is even a mile thick potentially in some places. And so you look at this here, guys, and the fact of the matter is you have all this water on land in the form of ice, and sea levels were lower. And so that the Bering Strait, the, the area between uh, what we would call North America, Alaska, and Asia, in this case Russia, East Siberia, would have actually been connected by land. And so the, the, there is this long-standing theory that people simply walked here on the land bridge following game, you know, their hunt. And um, that was a long theory for a long time. But now we found for a fact that people were here before, before 12,000 years ago. And so another theory is perhaps the Kelp Highway. If you look at a map and you, you look to see uh, Alaska and Russia and how close they are, uh, that perhaps there's this kelp, like seaweed, kind of coming up from the water, and you can tell it's kind of shallow. And people just naturally, in small boats, not ocean-going vessels, but just boats, could go from one from uh, mainland Asia to a little island, and then from that island you could see mainland North America, and people maybe just naturally spread. And so this is one theory. Now a lot of scientists have done studies, and the studies do seem to indicate that genetically speaking, uh, Native Americans have a lot in common with people from East Siberia, indicating that this is a solid theory. Um, and one thing we know is that these people are hunting. They're not just gathering. And we know that they're hunting because as the human population rises in archaeological evidence, other mammal populations are down. They're killing off 
predators of humans, something that might attack or eat humans. They're, they're hunting them down. Uh, they're also hunting food just strictly for meat. Um, and so mammal populations are going down at the same time human populations are going up here in the Americas. So they're not just gathering, they're also hunting. We know that based on archaeological evidence. Also, you can find animal bones and scarred or carved or however you want to talk about it. You can see cut marks which appear not to be just from cutting off meat, but from spear points into the bone which also is a sign of hunting um, but you have agricultural revolution and there's agricultural revolutions all over the world um, and so a little bit more than 4,000 years ago 2100 BCE before the common era uh, the agricultural revolution in the Americas starts at this time in the southwest and you might be thinking Mr. Morse, the Southwest is, is arid, it's desert, it's dry. You know, it doesn't get a lot of precipitation. It's not good soil for farming. And perhaps this is exactly why it starts here. If, if you're living in a lush, fertile area, you maybe can pick berries, pick other things that are growing naturally and don't have to in, invest a lot of time into agriculture. But if you grow into, a, if, you, if you're living in a spot that is scarce on resources like the Southwest. There's an old saying. Uh, what is the old saying? It goes along something, paraphrasing a bit, but, but necessity is the mother of invention. And so you have a necessity because you live in the desert that's not just bountiful with food resources, so you have to invent. And so it's during this time that maize, corn, maize starts to being, uh, starts being grown along river banks. And along riverbanks, you do have access to water. And a lot of these riverbanks are kind of down in canyons too, which provides you a little bit of shade. But as the farming starts taking place in the Southwest, it creates a more stable food source. And with more stable food source, you do less hunting and less gathering because you're making your own food. And once you start making your own food, you start developing things because of the food, like ceramic pots developed to store grains and keep mice or whatever animals out of it and to store seeds and your food. And it's kind of interesting. You don't really need to know this, but they can actually estimate how old some of the ceramics are just by looking at seed imprints because as they make the ceramics out of soft clay they have a lot of seed laying around and the seed gets imprinted into the soft clay and then it hardens into the pot and so the fact of the matter is uh, those seeds change over time how do they change over time humans pick winners and losers we like this type of corn we don't like that type of corn and so they plant the type of corn that they like and so humans are actually picking genetic winners and corn, I mean, you could almost argue it's a form of genetic engineering in agriculture, uh, you know, at a rudimentary level, but, but it technically is because they recognize that if the corn has this trait and they plant the seeds from that type of corn, those seeds will turn into the same type of corn with those traits. And so they can actually estimate how old the ceramics are simply by looking at the seeds and how changed or how not changed they are uh, relative to the time. But as farming stakes starts to take hold, permanent villages arise. You want to protect your cop, crops. You don't want to just plant a bunch of crops, a bunch of corn, and then leave it, and then not, you know, have wild animals pick through it, have other humans come by and take it. So the fact of the matter is, permanent villages start to take hold as a result of people farming, wanting to protect their crops. Permanent villages lead to an established social hierarchy. You get bigger populations, social hierarchy. When people are just moving around and you know, hunting and gathering, it tends to be smaller populations and less social hierarchy. When you start to develop towns, because you have an adequate food source, then you start to see social hierarchy and the, in these towns start to form. Nobody knows for sure how many people were in the Americas at the time of Columbus landing in 1492. Nobody truly knows. There's lots of estimates. We don't know. The honest truth is uh, we have archaeological evidence. We don't know. 
for a long time, there was these predictions that, oh, they were really, really, really high. You know, maybe even 100 million and this and that. And what had been the US and Canada. Overwhelmingly, the experts today say, no, that's not the case. Think about this, guys. Here's the deal. Most experts today say there were about 4 million people living in modern day United States and modern day Canada. To put it into some perspective, there's about 330 million people in the US today alone. 330 million people in the US alone. US and Canada back then had about 4 million people. So keep in mind, the world's population was much smaller across the globe, but especially in the Americas, about 4 million people. Now, some of you might say, uh, Mr. Morris, isn't it true that Mexico had a larger Native American population density? That is true at this time. You might know that Mexico City, modern day Mexico City today was this great Aztec capital back then. And the fact of the matter is, this is just the US and Canada's estimated population. Mexico was more uh, dense uh, population wise back at the time of Columbus arriving. Um, and one, one of the sad things is guys, is native populations, Americans today oftentimes don't appreciate just how diverse native American populations were. They were extremely diverse. Um, some native American cultures were completely different from one another and had very few similarities. Different cultures, different skills. Some Native American cultures were extremely peaceful, like the Arawaks uh, in the Caribbean. Some Native American cultures were very warlike, like the Aztecs. Different cultures. Some Native Americans never built permanent buildings. Some Native Americans, like the Aztecs or the Mayans, built massive, great architecture buildings. Uh, out of stone that are still standing, many of which are still standing to this day. So there's a vastly different culture from one Native American group to a different one. And a lot of Americans have kind of lost the appreciation of the vast diversity between Native Americans. Um, in fact, some experts estimate that there were over 100 different distinct languages, most of which, the vast majority of which are lost today, lost to time. And what would become the United States. Over 100 different distinct languages. We've lost most of them, unfortunately, because of what ends up happening to the Native Americans. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But um, just to give you some examples, like the Anasazi down in the southwest, they built huge Pueblo towns, sometimes five stories high in the southwest. Five stories high, and they'd build these towns into the side of, of uh, the canyons, alongside the rivers. And they could pull up their ladders and retreat to the higher stories if they were attacked. Um, kind of quite interesting there. Um, I'm just going to move more into the sunlight so you can see the sheep better here as the sun moves across the sky. Um, and so the, that's what the Anasazi are doing there. Um, Cahokia. At one point, it's estimated they had 20 to 40,000 people. And look, just about 700 years ago, 1300 AD. So just about 700 years ago, the city gets abandoned. And there's different theories about why it gets abandoned. And this is actually just outside of modern day St. Louis across the Mississippi River inside of Illinois, uh, near St. Louis, Missouri. But the fact of the matter is some people experts actually think it's because they had poor treatment of the environment that they would chop down all of the trees for these religious uh, ceremonies because it'd be constantly burning trees and so forth and that they'd cut them all out and then that hurt the get then they wouldn't have as many deer to hunt and and they wouldn't have as many um trees and have to go further out for their constructions and this is a warning sign to us today you know if we don't regard our resources and waste them, we maybe it will end up disappearing too. But in what would become the modern day United States, this is the biggest uh, Native American city uh, believed by many to have been 
in what would become the United States. Now the Aztecs, now they're down in our neighbors to the south, Mexico, and they have a much bigger population than any Native American group in what would become the United, uh, what would become the United States. And uh, they have an accurate solar can calendar. They're great architects. They conquer a lot of their neighbors. In fact, that was actually part of their downfall was when the Spanish arrive, um, they had been brutalizing a lot of their neighbors for so long that their neighbors helped them attack the Aztecs because they were sick of the Aztec control of the region. But uh, And I can't pronounce things very well, but um, Tenochtitlan, uh, had about a quarter million people by some estimates. That's a massive city. That's a massive city by world standards at this time. You know, the Spanish, when they first see uh, Tenochtitlan, which is the capital of, of uh, modern-day Mexico, Mexico City today, and the capital of the Aztecs back then, they were amazed of how big it was when they came over in the 1500s here. <clears throat> and they wrote back about how it was so massive and, and bigger than what they would see from a city in Spain. So it was a quite an impressive city. You also have people like the Iroquois, and they have a complex government because the Iroquois start off with uh, different tribes who had been at war. And then they actually start talking about how all of their tribes are just not doing well because they're constantly at war with one another. And according to legend, that's why they formed an alliance um, to kind of, uh, you know, hey, we're getting picked on by outside groups now because we fight so much amongst ourselves. Let's just form a military alliance for defense. <clears throat> and so the Iroquois is a confederation of different tribes. Perhaps the most famous one are, are the Mohawks. But, um, and what's interesting with the Iroquois is they oftentimes give women a leadership role. How so? Well, the leader, the chief, is a man, and it has to be a man. Wait a minute, Mr. Morris, you just said women have a leadership role. Who picks the male chief? The mothers. The mothers pick the male chief. And there's actually the ceremony, and they can they not also just get to pick them, but they also get to remove the male chief, the mothers, uh, if, 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 if they don't appreciate the job that he is doing. Or they knock off his antlers with the ceremony and then pick a new man to lead. And so although it is a male leader, he's beholden to the mothers in the society, which gives women, or at least women with children, a large political power role in society um, and there, there's other Native Americans um, and the Iroquois are like you know uh, and they're a vast group and they spread and their borders are fluctuating but they're most famous for being like in the New York area Pennsylvania area sometimes they go down all the way down to Virginia sometimes they even go far west is even the Michigan area up into Canada but th there's other groups for example you know maybe like the, the Pawnee or the Sioux out on the on the Great Plains and they may plant some small crops and then follow the game follow the buffalo on the Great Plains and then go back to their crops and hope it's still there um, out in the Great Plains um, you might have uh, you know a lot, a lot of other groups see uh, the Powhatan in modern-day Virginia um, and uh, Powhatan they're gonna become famous for their interactions with uh, Jamestown and they do a little bit of farming too none of these groups per se do the same kind of farming uh maybe that like the english did in europe except for i mean the aztecs still had some really cool farming um they would build these uh, little floating islands uh to, to kind of farm on here but the first european known to step foot on what would be american the american continents is leif erikson there's this guy named bjarni herolfsson and he actually gets blown off course um, and he goes past Iceland and he's off the coast of Canada and he sees it. His crew begs him to stop, begs him to kind of get out and, uh, he doesn't though. And he goes back and he tells his friend Leif Erikson about it. And Leif Erikson using the exact same boat that Bjarni Herolfsson had, um, had used goes and he's the first known European to step foot on American soil. These Vikings, they, they create a couple colonies, but those colonies die off. In between here and there, we know other Europeans stopped by. We know that some uh, English fishermen, for a fact, had came to America. 
But the fact of the matter is, Columbus gets the credit, right or wrong, for being the first European to discover the Americas, because when he does, it changes America. Lee Erickson comes here, it doesn't really make a big difference. And people kind of forget about it. And that's an old legend. I don't believe those old tales. They're, they're, they're you know, just people making up stories. When Columbus comes here, it changes the world forever. Europe's never the same again. The Americas are never the same again. Africa, never the same again. The world, never the same again. And the Renaissance, why did it change when Columbus hit, but not perhaps Erickson? Well, the Renaissance had happened in between Erickson coming here and Columbus coming here. And so the Renaissance, Europe is leaving the Dark Ages. No, we're no longer in the, the medieval times. And how, how has Europe changed to kind of to kind of fit this? Well, think about this now, guys. Europe has become more prosperous, longer lifespans. And with prosperity, they're going to want to seek more trade, especially spices from Asia. Other things, too, but especially spices from Asia. Europe's more educated. The population's going up. More births, longer lifespans. And you get stronger central governments. Before the Renaissance, you have a lot of, like, like vassal states and little lords controlling long, er like, small areas. Uh, it's a very fragmented uh, Europe. And now you start to see stronger central governments. You start to see a modern-day France, uh, a big, big state kind of start to form. You start to see England start to form. So you get these stronger central governments. You start to see nation states, countries start to form in, in kind of a modern sense. Um, and so Europe's ripe for expansion. They're prosperous. They're doing well. And people like the monarchs of Spain can fund explorations by Columbus and so forth with these stronger central governments. And so you start to see Europe expand. They're ripe for expansion. And uh, the classical tradition of the Greeks had been maintained by Arab scholars during the medieval time. Guys, this is one of the biggest things. This is just huge. Uh, you can't stress this enough. This is like the invention of the internet. The printing press by Johann Gutenberg, 1440. Because before there are very, very few books. Most of them are the Bible, monks handwriting out the Bible. And you have this metal typeset and you can put it into this kind of like grid-like uh, system. And then you just stamp it into the ink, stamp it on paper, and you can print the same page over and over and over again. And then change the metal typeface into new words and sentences and make books. And so with this, you get an explosion of information, just like the internet gave us an explosion of information in my time. This is just as important to the internet, perhaps even bigger. And yet it's such a simple invention, but it's a step forward into a modern world. And so this helps with this whole education and, and so forth. Guys, at first trade seemed to be getting both sides, uh, the Americas and Europe seem to be getting a good deal. Uh, think about this. Europe can make metal tools and glass beads cheaply. A Paris factory, a London factory uh, can make glass beads and metal tools cheaply. In America, North America, they don't, they can't make these things cheaply. They don't have some of these things. And what's dirt cheap, relatively speaking, in Europe is of high value, high importance, expensive in North America. Conversely, furs, fashionable in Paris, are expensive in Europe, but dirt cheap in North America. Think beaver pelts, French traders. And so, guys, uh, both sides are kind of winning with a lot of this initial trade, except for perhaps things like beavers and other animal populations with the fur trade. But both sides are tending to, to, to kind of win here. Europe, though, they come over oftentimes in most situations kind of with this air of superiority that our culture is better. We need to impose our way of doing things on you. And you get this Colombian exchange, Colombia, meaning Columbus. That's kind of like the root word there, Columbus, exchange across the Atlantic from Europe to the Americas and back and, and Africa's in there, too. 
And what are some of the biggest things kind of happening with this? Well, fatal diseases spread. Diseases spread both ways. We just remember more the ones that come to the Americas. Why? Because it's devastating to Native American populations. Some estimates say, and you get different estimates, some estimates say over 90% of Native American populations are wiped out by disease. Now, a lot of this disease was spread just incidentally. The fact that Europeans came to the Americas for a fact meant that disease was going to spread, period. However, some disease was spread intentionally. There are examples of Europeans fighting Native Americans and then saying, oh, we're sorry we've been fighting. We want to offer you a peace deal. And to show our commitment to peace, here's a bunch of blankets. And they know that these blankets have been infected with smallpox. They don't quite fully understand modern germ theory like we would today, but they did, the Europeans did connect if somebody has smallpox, if you then use their blankets, clothing, etc., that uh, you could get it to. And uh, there are some examples of Europeans specifically deliberately spreading smallpox to Native American populations under false, peaceful pretenses. Um, but you also get food spread. Food goes both ways. Um, some of the food coming uh, to the Americas, you do get plants like wheat, which might be a big one. But I think the biggest thing is, is you get um, domesticated animals, cows, pigs, you know, stuff like that, you know, uh, meat, a lot of these domesticated, even horses, I know that's not food, but, but you know, horses are huge to mankind and they can help uh, sometimes like, you know, uh, with hunting, food, food getting, and sometimes you can even use horses to maybe pull a plow or whatever, it's not quite yet perhaps, but um but you also get a lot of food going to uh, Europe. Tomatoes, potatoes, you know, and people think of the potatoes as being Irish today. Well, they came from the Americas, right? Um, and, and corn, and in the American, the US Capitol building, a lot of the pillars have corn at the top. Why? Because it's a native to America crop. You get ecological transformations with a lot of these new crops, with a lot of the farming that changes, a lot of the plants that change. Um, you also get, um, you know, adopted, uh, both sides will start to adopt useful aspects of each other's um, uh, cultures and so forth over time. A lot of Native Americans start doing perhaps European ways of starting fires. Uh, some, uh, Europeans might start using some uh, Native American ways of farming and sandy soil that they weren't used to. Um, people outside the aristocracy tended to now start growing in power back in Europe. Why? Through the trade, the merchants, getting powerful off bringing stuff from the old world to the new world. Tobacco, sugar are two of the first big ones here. Um, <clears throat> Africa. Guys, Europe, ta Europe taps into a pre-existing uh, slave trade to replenish their workforce. The African uh, kingdoms would often take slaves during war. And it was a slightly different kind of uh, slavery. They might not be slaves for life. They might be treated a little bit better. But Europe taps into it to, to work sugar plantations, to work tobacco fields. And, and they would often trade gold, iron, manufactured products for slaves. That's typically how Europeans tapped into the slave trade. Although there are some, are some examples of Europeans going in and um, capturing human beings themselves. Slavery is an evil institution. Unfortunately, it's existed all over the globe uh, throughout much of history, unfortunately. But Europe couldn't impose their will on Africa in the 1500s, in the 1600s, like it did later in the 1800s because of diseases. Many Europeans would die if they stayed a whole year. And some African states had large standing armies that the Europeans couldn't really contend with with just a boat. And so Europe had a hard time trying to conquer um, Africa during this time. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. Now Spain, they were the first big player in the New World because although Columbus is an Italian, he's sailing under the flag of Spain. Remember, it's the Spanish monarchs that are funding this whole um, 
uh, exploration by Columbus. And the Pope blesses Spain's claim. He splits the new world between Spain and Portugal, with Spain getting the bulk of it. The Treaty of Tordesillas, and remember I can't pronounce things very well, but the, the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494. And Spain gets the bulk. And basically, they, they draw like a, what would be a longitude line. And you know how Brazil sticks out a little bit from the rest of South America, kind of? That is the spot that Portugal gets with the Pope's blessing. And guess what? South America speaks Spanish, generally speaking, except for Brazil, which speaks Portuguese, generally speaking. And so that's why Brazil speaks port Portuguese, which is a similar language to Spanish anyways. And uh, most most other places uh, in, in South America will speak Spanish. Uh, Spain utilized the encomienda system. At first they have, you know, the, you know, the, the conquistadors conquering, but they're going to change from a land of plunder to settlement with the encomienda system. And they reward the Spanish people who help conquer it for the Spanish crown with their own towns or maybe even bigger amounts of land. If they, uh, if they helped conquer, you know, like really, really well, or were maybe a higher and more important leader. And then, and then you get your own town. And then what do you get to do with your own town? You get to, to help develop it and raise it, but also tax it and then share, share the money. Uh, you have to send some back to the crown. And one thing really important with Spain is uh, spreading Catholicism. In fact, they say Spain, a simple way, it might be oversimplifying a bit, but they say the three things about Spain and the New World are the three G's. God, they're spreading Catholicism. In fact, up and down the West Coast, those were a lot of Spanish Catholic ministries. You look at like San Jose, San meaning Saint, San Francisco, San Diego. A lot of those had been missionary places. Uh, another G is glory. You know, I'm a, I'm a conquistador, conquering. And then uh, God, glory, and gold. And they're coming here for gold. Um, France. Spain tends to have not so good relationships with Native Americans, generally speaking. France, although they're not perfect, they tend to have very uh, much better relationships with uh, Native Americans in the New World than a lot of the other countries. Look at their economy. It's fur trade. The French come over here with less women and they're trading fur. Trade is very conducive to good relationships. Hey, Native Americans, I'm going to give you glass beads and metal tools that you can't make yourself that you want and then I'll give and then I'll give you these that you want in exchange for you giving me something I want, like a beaver pelt. And so that tends to build good relationships. Also, the French tended to come here with less women. And there are a lot of French men who would marry Native American women. The French are famous for settling areas like Quebec up in Canada, and also areas such as Louisiana. Don't forget. The first Europeans to settle Michigan happens to be the French. Look at the oldest cities, European-based cities in Michigan. They're all French names. Sault Ste. Marie, St. Ignace, Detroit, or Detroit. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. Don't you guys, you can leave a comment. Don't you guys think a uh, uh, Detroit sounds like a lot more romantic than Detroit. Um, t tell me if you agree. And the French are also spreading Catholicism. Pierre Marquette, uh, Pierre Marquette is a famous French Catholic missionary who spends time here in Michigan as a missionary trying to convert people to Christianity. Catholicism. The English... They're the last of these big players on the scene between the Spanish and French, but they're going to end up winning a large control of North America. In large part because the English send more people here than any other European power. And what's kind of going on uh, with um, what's kind of going on with the English here? Let me get more in the sun for you guys here. Uh, sorry about that. The sun keeps moving across the sky. 
sky here. But, uh, oh, you can see Mr. Donnelly there. There's Mr. Donnelly. But, guys, uh, the English, uh, the nationalism merges with Protestantism. Nationalism merges with Protestantism. Back then, to be English was to be Protestant. There's strong anti-Catholic feelings. Protestantism. Protesting the Catholic Church. The Protestant Reformation uh, had taken a hold in parts of Europe, especially in England. The irony is it actually kind of like really gets its blessing from uh, King Henry VIII just looking for a divorce and the Pope doesn't grant it. So he kind of breaks off and makes his uh, <coughs> Church of England and so forth. But anyways, uh, Calvinists, that's a big type of Protestantism. And they believe in predestination. They believe that, you know, so God makes everyone. And when he makes you, he knows if you're going to heaven. He knows if you're going to hell. And uh, the Puritans are going to be a big European English group here that comes over. And the Puritans are going to believe in uh, predestination. But more on them, a different chapter. Queen Elizabeth I She's very, very popular. She's widely beloved. And it's in large part because she takes over from her sister, half-sister, Queen Mary, who's Bloody Mary, who's this Catholic queen who's imposing the Catholic Church on an England that wants to be Protestant, and she's, she's doing it with an iron fist. And so Queen Elizabeth I is very popular in part to who, her being Protestant. And then she's also popular because, you know, she helps, uh, you know, beat the Spanish Armada. She dresses up in armor and uh, the English have this massive victory against Spain because the Pope is very anti-England and, and Spain's going to try to bring them back under the Pope's control, back under Catholicism. Uh, and when the English come here, they had already conquered Ireland and they call the Irish wild. And what's kind of interesting is when the English first come here, they call the Native Americans Irish, wild. They're I, they're wild just like the Irish. They're backwards. They don't use land how it, quote, ought to be used. Notice that's kind of like a uh, the English mindset. There's a certain way to use land. And if it's not being used properly, then they have a kind of a right to come in and take and use the land the way it, quote, ought to be used. We'll talk more about that later when we talk about John Locke here. But, but but they compare the Irish to Native Americans. They don't use a land right. We're going to come in and farm it properly in their mindset. And then also, they're both wild. They're not civilized. The Irish are wild. The Native Americans, they're wild. The English come here, almost done with the chapter one. The English come here and form Roanoke. This is the first English colony. It disappears, though. And people still debate about, uh, you know, how, what happened to it? Did they get attacked by Native Americans? Did they just starve? Did the Spanish come up and, and kill them off? We don't know. Uh, they were supposed to leave this <clears throat> sign if they if they left in an emergency. But they had left uh, Croatan, which is a nearby tribe. Some people think that the, um, the people at Roanoke just merged in with a nearby tribe and kind of blended into one. And there were stories, and we don't know how accurate these rumors are, or we don't know how inaccurate they are, we don't know, and we'll never really find out for sure probably. But the fact of the matter is, there were stories of Native Americans having blue eyes and blonde hair uh, and doing English style farming not too far from Roanoke had been after it disappeared. Uh, Jamestown is going to become the first permanent English colony. But it gets off to a horrible start. You know, the, the first year, uh, many of the people die, most of the people die. The second year, you know, that's the same story. And one of the biggest problems was they're all looking for gold. And everyone got to share it didn't matter whether you planted food. It didn't matter how hard you worked in the fields for planting food. You got to share the food equally with everyone. So people were out looking for gold because the Spanish, they bring back boatloads of gold and have upset the European economy in part because of it. And the fact of the matter is 
people are out looking for gold. They're not farming. And it's going to be John Smith who says, if you don't farm, you don't eat. And he's credited with helping turn it around. And he helps build a positive relationship with Powhatan, uh, who's a local chief. Uh, who has this, it, was, it was a sizable force, uh, basically an empire. However, once he leaves, the Powhatan and English start fighting again in and around Jamestown. So that's chapter one. Leave comments. Send me questions. Uh, state any opinions you have. Guys, have a good day. Stay positive. We are BR. Oh, yeah. Heck yeah.